testing, how's that? I can hear that works.
Thank you, Sister Wilson, for that wonderful prelude music. We're grateful to have all of you here today to hear uh, Brother Griffiths speak about building bridges of understanding in a politically polarized America. It's a very timely topic, and we're grateful that he was able to be in town and made time for us tonight. We're grateful to, the, <clears throat> to those that are attending from as many as five stakes. There are five Highland stakes, and then we've invited the YSA stake that serves in this area to attend as well. Thanks to those of you that are here in person, and we acknowledge there are probably multiples more of you that are watching virtually. Thank you and welcome. Um, I'm Tyler Sheffield, the stake president of the Highland Utah East Stake. Sister Susan Wilson is, our, is on the piano, and chorister will be Dan Stratton. A recording of tonight's devotional will, will be available on our stake website, highlandutahestake.org. Thank you, Brother Griffith, for allowing us to retain that and let more people view that. Um, after Judge Griffith's remarks, he'll answer some questions. We won't have any questions from the live audience. Instead, we would ask that you email your questions to highlandfireside at gmail.com. So Highland where we are, fireside at gmail.com. I've got great fondness for Judge Griffith. I first became aware of him when, when somebody at a coordinating council told me I should read his talk called The Very Root of Christian Doctrine. And it instructs us or inspires us that being converted to Jesus Christ changes our behavior. And understanding the atonement helps us become more like Jesus and helps us overcome things and, and be rewarded. And it's the very purpose of this life. So today I met with a group of uh, brethren that are striving to improve. And I printed out this article and gave that to them. Thank you. Our opening prayer will be by given by Candace Taylor after we sing the hymn number 220, Lord, I Would Follow Thee. After Sister Taylor's prayer, Sarah McGill is going to introduce Judge Griffith. We thank Sarah and Johnny McGill. They coordinated our Seeking Truth devotional, and they facilitated um, Brother Griffith being here tonight. Thanks, Sarah and Johnny, for all your work. So the hymn number 220 and then Sister Taylor.
Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be gathered this evening in thy house to hear the words that Brother Griffiths has prepared for us. We pray that our hearts and our minds might be opened and be filled with light and truth as we ponder and reflect on the things that have been prepared. We ask thy spirit to be with us, be with those in any place that they are listening, that as we pray for our country and pray for the good in the world, that thou will enlighten us and fill us with the promptings and inspiration we need to follow thy path and to emulate the life of thy son. Be with us as we travel this journey of life to become closer to him. Help us to remember thy plan and to remember the atonement that has been made for us. Bless us to draw close to him each day. We are so grateful for him and his sacrifice and the opportunity to be here and hear the words that will be spoken tonight. Be with us and bless us and those that may be sick or needing thy help at this time. And we say this humbly in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Candace, for that prayer. <clears throat> I'm grateful for the opportunity to introduce Judge Griffith tonight. Um, I really feel like this is something the Lord wanted us to have. I was looking for him, and he found me. Um, and it just was kind of a miracle the way this came together. So I'm grateful for that. In 2005, President George W. Bush appointed Judge Thomas B. Griffith to the U.S. Court of Appeals in the D.C. Circuit, often referred to as the second most important court in the nation. Judge Griffith stepped down from the D.C. Circuit in 2020 and is currently a lecturer on law at Harvard Law School, also a fellow at the Wheatley Institute of BYU, and he is also special counsel in the Washington, D.C. office of the international law firm of Hunton Andrews Kurth and an act, and active in rule of law projects in the former communist nations of Central and Eastern Europe. In 2021, President Biden appointed Judge Griffith to the President's Commission on the Supreme Court. At the time of his appointment to the D.C. Circuit, Judge Griffith was serving as the general counsel of Brigham Young University. Prior to that, he had been Senate legal counsel, the nonpartisan chief legal officer of the United States Senate. After graduating from BYU and before beginning his legal studies at the University of Virginia, Judge Griffith was a full-time employee of the church education system, directing seminary and institute of religion programs in the Baltimore, Maryland area. His service in the church includes a full-time mission in Southern Africa, bishop of a family ward in Northern Virginia, and stake president of a YSA stake in Provo. He also serves on the advisory board of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship and the Faith Matters Foundation. Judge Griffith devotes a great deal of his time to speaking and writing about the need to emphasize civic charity in American political life. His writings have appeared in the Harvard Law Review Forum, the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, the Wall Street Journal, BYU Studies, the Deseret News, and Deseret Magazine. Brother Griffith is married to Susan Stell Griffith, and they are the parents of six children and grandparents of 11 grandchildren. They are both converts to the church, each having joined the church independently of one another in the McLean, Virginia area. <clears throat> Excuse me. They were married while students at BYU. Susan is a professional genealogist, and the Griffiths live in rural northern Virginia. It's a great privilege to have Judge Griffith here with us tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. I appreciate it. And uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I, I, as I look around, I'm seeing people from like every stage of my life, and I, I, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit overwhelming. I even have my boss here. Paul Edwards is the director of the Wheatley Institute, so boy, the pressure is really, uh, really on. Uh, uh, Sarah, that was a lovely introduction. If I can just, can I just tweak it just in one way? Judge Griffith couldn't make it tonight. But, but Brother Griffith showed up instead, okay? So can we do that? Can we do that? Uh, so no, I'm, I'm grateful to be here and thankful uh, to, to Sarah and to, the, uh, to the, uh, President Sheffield for uh, creating this opportunity. So, so let's start with the obvious. Um, uh, the United States is politically polarized, right? Now that's obvious. What may not be obvious to most of us is how serious it is. Um, Richard Haas, 
who's the president on the Council on Foreign Relations. You may see him as a talking head on some of the cable shows. Uh, he was the U.S. envoy to, the nor to Northern Ireland. So whether you agree with his views or not, this man knows <clears throat> something about conflict and international conflict. He's written a book recently where he says the greatest threat to the United States doesn't come from China or Russia. No, those are threats. Those are serious threats. But they're not the greatest threat. Richard Haas, foreign policy expert, someone who's schooled and experienced in, in, in conflict, says the greatest threat to the United States today, he believes, comes from our political polarization. Um, we, we, we heard President Nelson's, you know, I, sh I should have said, you know, we don't need to have this fireside anymore. President Nelson preempted it, right? <laughs> he preempted it in his Palm Sunday address uh, in, in general conference. But you remember the phrase he used in there about the venomous, the venomous contention of our, of our civil discourse? Uh, we all see it uh, around us. Here, here's what Arthur Brooks has to say uh, about the, the present moment. He says, political scientists find that our nation is more polarized than it has been at any time since the Civil War. Now, social scientists tell us that's what's new about the current circumstance, which makes it different from some of us remember the 60s and 70s. There was a lot of disagreement, a lot of division there. But what makes this time different from any time that social scientists have examined before is something that's called affective, A, affective polarization. And what affective polarization is, it means when your, your hatred for your opponent is stronger than the tie to your own people. And so what's driving uh, much of the discussion is hatred for others less than commitment to your own to your own cause that is new what is new is contempt has replaced mere disagreement we, we're Americans we better disagree about things right I mean that's one of the great things we get to do with this country is to disagree and to disagree passionately but what's new is the level of contempt that accompanies that that uh, that that disagreement. Okay, so so the social scientists uh, out there, I, I'm not one, so I, but I borrow from social scientists. You, you, you'll like these. Here's some numbers for you. Okay, some from numbers for you. Um, uh, almost 60 percent of Republicans and Democrats have very unfavorable views of the other. Not just unfavorable, but very unfavorable view of the others. That's a threefold increase since 1994, and it's a 30% increase since 2016. That's new. Here's another one. 72% of Republicans think that Democrats are more immoral than Republicans. And 63% of Democrats think the same of Republicans. See, it's not that I just disagree with you about the role of marginal tax rates. I now think you're a bad person. You're an evil person. Once again, those numbers are up almost 20 percent since 2016. It's gotten to the point now where social scientists tell us that the, the level of enmity in the American population rivals the enmity that exists between Palestinians and Israelis. Now, what that leads to this affective polarization, one of the things it leads to is what social scientists call the perception gap. The, the idea that we really don't understand one another. Uh, a lot of it has to do that we're, you know, sorting into our own bubbles and we, you know, we only consume information from outlets that we like. There, there's all sorts of reasons for that. But, but, but here are some of the numbers that, that, that underscore the perception gap that comes out of this polarization. The ma a majority of Republicans and Democrats have no or very few friends in the other party. Majority of Republicans have no or very few friends who are, are, are Democrats and, 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 and vice versa. Only 14% of Republicans have a lot of Democratic friends. Only 9% of Democrats have a lot of Republican friends. Each group, Democrats and Republicans, thinks the other party despises them at twice the actual rate that they do. 
and, and, and when, when, when each group is asked about the views of the other, they, they, they get it off by a lot. Democrats are off by 20% in, in terms of the views of Republicans. The Republicans are off by 30% in, in terms of their views of Democrats. Here are some examples of that. A majority of Republicans think that 36% of Democrats are agnostic or atheist when only 9% are. And, and, and a majority of Republicans think that 32% of Democrats are LGBT when only 6% are. So you see the perception gap here? Okay, let, let's, let's do it on the other side. Uh, a majority of Democrats think that 44%, 44 of Republicans make more than $250,000 a year, when we know that number is actually 80% do. Okay, you're listening. Okay, I, just, I threw that in just to see if you're really listening. No, the number is 2%. 2% do. So, so the, all this leads to, and is, is partly caused by what Arthur Brooks calls the outrage industrial complex. The outrage industrial complex, Brooks says, in American media, which profits handsomely from our addiction to contempt. Okay, so now, now you're laughing, you're with me, so now I may some, say something that offends you, okay? So I, we can still be, let, let's test it here, right? I'll say something offensive and you be nice to me. How about that, okay? Can we do that? If, if you're getting a majority or a very large percentage of your information, I won't call it news, of your information from cable, from talk radio, social media, you're being played. You know that, don't you? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying don't consume it. It's, some of it's entertaining and fun, you know? Yeah, so, it's got some attractive personalities, you know? And it's a, I'm not saying stay away from it, but just realize you're, you're being played, right? There, there is not breaking news every 10 minutes in the world, only on cable. And, and why is that? Well, because they've, they've figured out how to increase Revenue from ads, that's what it is. Now, just, just realize that, okay? Go, go ahead and you know, watch MSNBC, watch you know, CNN, watch Fox. I'm not gonna say don't do that. But when you do, recognize that's the model that they have created to make money. So you're being played. Don't think that you're getting news from any of those sources. You're, you're getting other stuff, but you're not getting news uh, from it. Uh, and again, to quote President Nelson, he talks about the venomous contention that infects our civil dialogue. Okay, okay, what, one last bad news thing, okay, and then, then we'll get to the, 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 the good news. So, so Jonathan Haidt, the social psychologist from NYU who's done such, so much interesting work to teach us about how our minds work and how we perceive others, he is no chicken little sky is falling person, okay? But this is what he said recently. There is a very good chance that we will have a catastrophic failure of American democracy because we just don't know what a democracy looks like when you drain all trust out of the system. Well, I want to disagree with the great Jonathan Haidt. I think we do know what a democracy looks like when you drain all trust out of the system. And it looks an awful lot like January 6th. That's what it, that's what it looks like. Okay, okay, so there's the bad news. So let's, let's be positive. President Oaks tells us to be positive about this, right? So I'm trying my best, President Oaks, to, to be positive about this. How do we build trust in our democracy? That's the challenge. How do we build trust in our, in our democracy? So I'm gonna give you something easy and something hard. Here's the easy part. This is very easy part. You build trust in our election system. Uh, the fact is, I hope this doesn't offend again, the 2020 election was lost. It was not stolen, okay? It was lost, it was not stolen. Um, that, that, that is incontrovertible, I'm sorry. Um, uh, uh, not that I'm the final word on it, but I was so concerned about the allegations that were being made that I convinced two other former federal judges appointed by Republican presidents, Michael McConnell, who's now at Stanford, uh, J. Michael Ludig, um, who was on the Fourth Circuit, and, and a number of prominent conservatives to spend a year doing a deep dive into all of the allegations. And we wrote a report, it's called Lost Not Stolen, 
the conservative case that Biden won and Trump lost the 2020 presidential election. Go online, look at it. I'm, fr I'm afraid there's, anyway, it's just clear. It's not, it's, it's not, so, so, uh, so one thing that you can do is, 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 is when your aunt or your brother or your neighbor tells you, you know, there was so much fraud in the 2020 election that, you know, that it was stolen from, 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 uh, from Trump and Biden. That is just not true. And you need to tell them in a gentle and kind way it's not true. As it turns out, our election administration system, while not perfect, is really, really good. And it's really, really transparent. Now, I grew up with stories of ballot boxes in Philadelphia being stuffed and, and dead people in Chicago voting. And you know what? All of those stories were true. <laughs> they were true. But there has been one of the great untold stories is the change that's occurred largely since 2000 that has professionalized and standardized election administration throughout, throughout the country. So this is an easy thing to do. Just tell people, no, you can have full confidence in our election administration system. It can get better. I, I, I'm, I, I know that. But you can have full confidence. And the 2020 election uh, was actually the most transparent election in American history. Uh, so that's the easy thing to do. OK? That's the easy thing. OK, here's the hard thing. Here's the hard thing. That's what I'll spend the rest of my time talking about. Uh, the hard thing is it, it's got to be more than civility, okay? We, we, we all here talk about civility, and I'm all for civility. It's great. But once again, as Arthur Brooks points out, if I were to tell you that my wife and I were civil to one another, you would say, get some counseling, right? <laughs> get some counseling. And, and, and I think he's right. I, I, think, I think what's required is something more than civility. Uh, and because we're in this setting, you will appreciate, this group will appreciate the way not every group I speak to appreciates, the, the best work done on this idea of that it takes more than civility, it actually takes love. And it's by a guy, you've probably heard of this guy, his name is Matthew S. Holland. And, and he wrote his doctoral dissertation, Elder Holland, Elder Holland the Younger wrote his doctoral dissertation at Duke University and got it published by Georgetown University Press. Wrote a book called Bonds of Affection, Civic Charity, and the Making of America. And what Matt Elder Holland, what do you call him now? I guess he called him Elder Holland, but he was Matt when he wrote this. Professor Holland, a fascinating history where he traces this idea that he calls civic charity from the earliest days of the American experience, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, John Winthrop, right, and, and traces it through the founding of America and sees that everywhere in the founding, all the way up until Lincoln, there's this theme of civic charity, this idea that what, what you need to create the country we want to create is actually charity. It's actually it's actually love. The highest expression of this comes from Lincoln's first inaugural address. And these are words that for Americans are, 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 are scriptural, right? They're part of our secular scripture where, where, where Lincoln pleads, we are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection, right? Now, of course, the irony here is Lincoln gave that address at his first inaugural. That warning went unheeded. War came, and we are still living with the consequences of that, right? We're still living with the consequences of that. But anyway, there's the idea. There's the idea. Civic charity, the idea that it's more than civility, it's actually love. Okay, now that sounds a little gauzy and sentimental, I get you, but hear me out on the next one. Now I'm going to borrow... Uh, from the research of another uh, scholar, a young man named Derek Webb, who was a, a student of Michael McConnell's at Stanford uh, Law School. And while he was there, wrote this just fat, for nerds like me, a fascinating article that was entitled, The Original Meaning of Civility, colon, you always have to have a colon in a law review article. The Original Meaning of Civility, colon, Democratic Deliberation, 
at the 1787 convention. Okay, that, that, that's the title. But, he, but here's, here's, what he, here's, what, here's what Derek does. So we all, we're all familiar with the story, the miracle of uh, you know, Philadelphia uh, in the summer of 1787. The, cons the convention is called to come up with a constitution to, to, to you know, get past the Articles of Confederation, start a, start a new nation. And it wasn't going well. In July, it was on the cusp of failure right, the brink of failure. In fact, there were some delegates that were packing their bags and, and, and ready to leave. So if, 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 you were, if you were betting on what's gonna happen in July, you'd bet no, nothing's gonna happen. Well, we know it worked. September, by September, they had produced a, a constitution. And, and in the letter that George Washington wrote that to send to the Continental Congress with the Constitution, with the constitution he explained how they did it. How they snatched victory from the jaws of defeat. And these are Washington's words. He says, the Constitution, now listen to, I'm going to come back to this, so, but listen, this is 18th century English. It's like, like reading James Talmadge, you know, you know it's hard stuff, right? It's hard. So, so we got to, got to, got to, yeah, that was 19th century. It's tough for me. But, 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 but I'll read it slowly and we'll go over it a couple times. Here's what Washington said The Constitution is the result of the spirit of amity and that mutual deference and accommodation which the peculiarity of our political circumstances rendered indispensable. Okay, allow me to translate that, okay? They were, they were in a situation, there was only one way out, and the only way out was Amity? What, what does amity mean? We're, can we, well, we're not in Sacramento. We can do this. We're going to treat this more like an institute class. What amity? That's not a word we use. What's the word amity mean? Close? Love. No, it actually, it, you know, the, the root of it is love. Now, friendship is the most common use of it, but, but it's the spirit. Let's say, spirit of friendship. I'll, I'll, I'll take you that. But realize it's actually more than that. Spirit of amity. Mutual deference. What does that mean? He said three things. Spirit of amity, mutual deference, and accommodation. What's mutual deference mean? Respect. You, oh, you go first. No, 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 you go first. No, no, please. I, I defer to you. No, you're, it's that sort of attitude. Accommodation. What does accommodation mean? Yeah, you get your way. I'm going to let you get your way. I'm going to accommodate you. You don't have to change on that at all. I'm going to accommodate you. So according to George Washington, who fortunately we're beginning to understand, Madison was important, but Washington was the indispensable man in the creation of the Constitution. He's finally getting his due in, in that regard. But the indispensable man says this Constitution came because of the spirit of amity, mutual deference, and accommodation. Okay, there's nice language. Webb decided, what's he talking about? <laughs> what does he mean? You know, what, what do these phrases mean? So Webb did a deep dive into the proceedings to try and figure out what Washington meant by that. And this is what Webb came up with. This is what Webb thinks, Derek Webb thinks, that what George Washington was, was, was talking about. First of all, he looked at the rules of the, of the convention. And there were a couple of rules that he thought were really pretty interesting, that they were conveying some important information to us, right? The first one is, if you were in Philadelphia, you had to show up at Independence Hall. You had to be there. Um, uh, you know, you, 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 you couldn't take a break, you couldn't go home and take a siesta. You, if you weren't there when the proceedings started, they would send the sergeant arms out to get you, okay? You had to be there, that's the first one. Mandatory, mandatory attendance. Second rule that he looked at. And, then, and we're going to look at each of these rules and how they work together. The second rule is when someone held the floor during the convention, not only could you not talk, you also couldn't read, you couldn't write, you couldn't scroll, you know, you couldn't. No, the, the idea was no, when somebody had the floor, that was the only thing that was going on. The third rule that Webb looked at is there was no official record taken of the votes at the time. And, and so what that meant was you could actually change your mind on something. So in other words, let's imagine Proposition A is you vote on Proposition A the beginning of June and you say, yeah, I think that's a really good provision. I'm all for it. But then in July, you could say, you know, I've thought that through a little bit and I'm now against it. 
So you could actually change your mind and nobody would primary you, right? And no one would run, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna test to see how many political junkies are here. No one could run an attack ad against you showing you windsurfing in Boston Harbor going one direction and then another direction and then having a voiceover saying, I voted for it before I voted against it. Does anyone recognize it besides the junkie? That was an attack ad run by the president who appointed me, George W. Bush against John Kerry. And it was all, it was all laughable. I voted for it before I voted against it. <laughs> what hypocrisy, right? No, it, the framers did that. It, that was part of what they wanted to have happen. Okay, so Webb Web takes these three rules together. Got to be there. Got to pay attention. Got to pay attention to someone, and you can change your mind. And he comes up with this, this idea, this this value, that the framers who created the Constitution thought that if you got a group of people together, and they paid attention to one another, they might change their minds. They might change their minds. That is a value of the Constitution. Okay, now. That's good, but that's not the magic sauce. All that was good, says Webb, but here's the magic sauce. The magic sauce, the secret sauce in this. They partied with one another. They socialized with one another. Weren't a lot of boarding houses or taverns in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787. So these delegates ended up sleeping two, three, four in a room, sometimes three in a bed. They got to know each other really well, right? They had, and, 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 then, and then their work would, uh, the convention would typically run from 10 in the morning till 4 in the afternoon, Monday through Saturday, and then they'd, and then they'd, and then they'd break and they'd go eat. Same problem. Not that many taverns, so they ended up eating at the same place. And this is, this is what follows next is really cute. I don't mean that. I mean, it really is kind of cute. After a couple of weeks, they decided to form dinner groups, right? They formed dinner groups with, with one another. But these dinner groups weren't along ideological lines or regional lines. They were just kind of thrown together. So you could have somebody from South Carolina in the same dinner group as somebody from Massachusetts. And they got to know one another. They socialized with each other. And then at critical moments throughout the summer, Ben Franklin, who had the nice house, right? Had the nice house, pretty well to do. He would have a party at his house. He'd bring all the delegates together. Um, as I read what Derek Webb says, he had a great collection of port. <laughs> I won't ask this audience if anyone can educate me as to what port is, but it's a type of alcohol, right? right? So, uh, but apparently uh, Franklin's was the best on the East Coast or something, and he would break that out, and uh, you, you know, the, uh, the, the, the liquid would flow, and the, 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 the conviviality reigned, and the you know, uh, noise raised. They were having a great time with one another. George Mason from Virginia wrote to his son, and I won't give you his 18th century language because it's too, but he wrote to his son saying, you know what? I'm actually forming friends from Massachusetts. Who would have thought? Who would have thought that I could like somebody from Massachusetts? But socializing became a key point. Okay, so this all leads up to Webb's thesis that the critical moment of the convention comes in July where they now know one another, they trust one another, but it's still not going that well until a group of 11, I'm going to say the word, it's not a word that is likable in America today, mm, mm, mm. moderates. <laughs> Are any of you Hamilton fans? I mean, you know, you know the scene in, in Hamilton where they say, immigrants, we get things done, right? Moderates, we get things done, right? So 11 moderates got together, and they decided we are not going to let this thing fail. Uh-uh, we're not going to let it fail. They made a critical decision, and they got the others to buy into it. And here's the decision. This is really important. This is the key point of Webb's insight. I think it's the... This key insight, I think, is the key point for us today. They decided that they were going to compromise for the sake of unity before they knew the terms of the compromise. Do you get that? That is really risky, right? That's going in and saying, we're going to make this thing work 
and there are no preconditions here. We're going to make it work. Now, you can get abused as a negotiating strategy that way. I would not recommend this negotiating strategy in business or stuff like that. But, but it was desperate times called for desperate measures, they thought, and they agreed to compromise for the sake of unity before they knew the terms of the compromise. Now, let's just pause for a second. They made some really tough calls on that, right? And, and I'm not here to defend the calls that they made or to criticize them. I want to step back and see what's really going on here. What's really going on here is they decided they wanted unity, and they wanted unity more than they wanted their own individual uh, idea. So that, you want to talk about what the Constitution means? That's what it means. It creates a system of government that started with people approaching government that way, and the only way it continues is if people have that same spirit. You've all lived in. A uh, prominent conservative commentator says this, the American Constitution is intended to create common ground. Its structure compels Americans to be a little more accommodating of one another. An effective legislative accommodation, writes Levin, doesn't just give each of the two sides half a loaf. It gives us practical experience in living and acting together. Okay, so what does it mean to support and defend the Constitution? Well, part of it is if you're in Washington, you have to carry one of these around. You know, it's just, it just looks cool, right? You know? And it's better, I couldn't find my, my dog-eared one. It's better if it's all torn up and people, oh, wow, you know, yeah. But, you know, so, so how do you support and defend the Constitution? Well, the easy part, I mean, you, you study it, right? You, you, you learn its provisions, you, you learn its history. So that's, that, that's, that's clearly part of it. But I want to suggest, and, and, and my guess is we have some uh, uh, former military officers here. We have some current military officers. I don't see anybody in uniform. Uh, but we have uh, other people who've, uh, are in state, county, or federal government, and all of those people, all of us, have taken an oath to support and defend the Constitution. What does that oath mean? I think it means more than the rights that are protected by the Constitution. It, it, it means more than freedom of speech. I'm all for freedom of speech. I hate cancel culture. I'm all, I'm all for freedom of speech, but I'm telling you the Constitution, supporting and defending the Constitution means more than supporting freedom of speech. It means more than religious liberty. Hey, I'm all for religious liberty, you know, match my record against anyone on religious liberty, but the Constitution means more than religious liberty. I'm all for equal protection of the laws. One of the proudest votes I ever cast on the D.C. Circuit was a vote to uphold the Voting Rights Act that was later overturned by the Supreme Court. They were wrong on that. I will match my record on equal protection with anyone. Okay, it means more than guns. It means more than guns. Look at my, don't do this, but I'm just, look at my record. I, I, I was the poster child judge for the NRA, okay, uh, because I, I read the Second Amendment that it protects the right that gives you the right to protect yourself with a firearm. I mean, we can debate that later. But I'm telling you, the Constitution means a lot more than any of those things. Those, those are the trees. Here's the forest. The forest was explained to us by President Oaks and his Easter, remember it was on Easter two years ago, Easter Sunday talk, Saturday afternoon, a Sunday afternoon session of conference. What are you supposed to talk about when you're an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ on Easter Sunday in general conference. Well, you know, you're supposed to talk about the resurrection of Christ, right? What did he talk about? The divinely inspired Constitution. That suggests to me, that's so, that's so off script, right? That suggests to me, and I'm pretty confident of this, he thought that what he had to say then was so important that it would even preempt the expected talk on the resurrection of Christ, okay? The money line from that talk, it's a great talk. It really is. It's five principles of the Constitution. It's great. It's great. But the money line from that talk to me is where he says, on contested issues, we should seek 
to moderate and to unify. That is the best summation of the spirit of the Constitution, of how one can support and defend the Constitution that I have ever seen. And so if, if we want to ask ourselves, how do I support and defend the Constitution? How do I do it? I'll tell you how you do it. President Oaks told us, on contested issues, you seek to moderate and to unify. And if that doesn't describe your last social media post or your last Thanksgiving discussion uh, or, or, your, or, or, your, or, or your last interaction with anyone on politics, if that, if that doesn't describe you, I, see, I, I don't have any mantle or authority. I can't call you to repentance, and I hate calls to repentance anyway, but, but I'm telling you, if that doesn't describe you, repent, okay? <laughs> because because the, President Oaks has declared this is our role. This is the space we, as Latter-day Saints, are to occupy on contested issues. Think of any contested issue you want, okay? And ask yourselves, am I seeking to moderate and to unify? That's how we support and defend the Constitution today. So if, if you are an agent of division, sorry. I know you feel strongly about the Second Amendment. I do too. But if you're using your views on the Second Amendment to divide people, you are working against the Constitution. If you want to be a supporter of the Constitution, you become an agent of reconciliation. Now here's the really bad news about that. That is really hard work. <laughs> it's so much easier to be an agent of division you just get with your own folks and yell and scream about others and how bad they are. That's easy. The hard thing is to become an agent of reconciliation. Okay, so now, but there's good news on that front. There's some good news on that front. Uh, as it turns out, 93% of Americans are sick and tired of the status quo. They, they're just really tired. It, it, the, the new phrase has been developed, right? The exhausted majority. They're just tired of, of, this, of this division. And 71% of those folks feel strongly about it. They're really, 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 really sick of it. And so there are some good things going on out there on, on this front. And I want to highlight a couple of them and suggest that these are things that we ought to be aware of and ought to be supporting. Okay? So let, let me tell you one. You've probably heard of it. It's a, it's a, a project called Braver Angels. And here's the idea behind braver angels. They go to university campuses, they go to, to towns and cities around the country, and they hold these discussions. They call them debates, but it's different than a lot of debates I've ever seen. They, they hold these discussions. Let, let me give you the sense of it. They'll, they'll get a group, and I'm going to exaggerate just a little bit, they'll get a group of Bernie Sanders supporters and a group of MAGA supporters, and they'll put them in the same room, and they'll, they'll debate a topic. But they teach them how to disagree with one another better. And, and, and what we mean by that is, so from social science data, we know this. You're never going to persuade someone to adopt your point of view if you hold them in contempt. It just doesn't work. I mean, we've all tried it, right? It doesn't work. And so what Braver Angels teaches folks is how to disagree better. And it turns out that it's Stuff you learn in primary that we have forgotten. You listen to other people. You make certain that you understand what they're saying before you respond. In other words, you say, okay, now wait a second. You feel this way about X. Am I, am I understanding you? And then you have to repeat to the uh, to other person's satisfaction and say, yep, yep, you got it. I understand. Only then can you say, now here's how I, here's how I view it. I view it a little bit differently than that. Okay. So, so Braver Angels does this all around the country. They've got lots of experience in this. And here's, here's what they've learned. Here's what they've learned. When they get the Bernie Sanders supporters and the MAGA supporters in there talking about guns or such, just pick, pick a contentious topic. As it turns out, even when they go through all of these techniques to, to, to disagree better, rarely, rarely if ever, does anyone change their mind about the issue. I mean, it rarely does the Bernie Sanders supporter say, oh, yeah, I'm opposed to gun control. And then rarely does the MAGA supporter say, yeah, let's, let's, let's you know, crack down on guns. That's not what happens. But what does happen is they change their mind. They change their view about the other person, about the other person. 
they realize, oh, these are good folks. They just see things differently that, that, that I do. And, and I want to suggest that is great progress. Because once again, the issue here isn't to stop disagreeing. The issue here is to stop disagreeing in a way that's contemptuous of, of, of the other person. So, that, so that's one great at that. Look them up, braver angels. They're really good. They're, and they're looking for volunteers, and they're here, they're here in Utah. Another one is an outfit called Unite, created by Tim Shriver, who is the son of Eunice Kennedy Shriver, the woman who started the Special Olympics. Every single law in the world that protects the rights of the intellectually disabled came from Eunice Kennedy Shriver. She created Special Olympics. Her son, Tim, runs the Special Olympics. A couple of years ago, he created a, a, an entity, one of these great outfits that are bipartisan, nonpartisan, trying to get folks to unite with, with one another. And they've got all sorts of great things. Here's, here's the really interesting news. They have picked the state of Utah to be a place of particular emphasis. And the person who does it is sitting right over here, Tammy Pfeiffer. Tammy got me to do something I thought I would never ever do in my life. She got me to go to a commencement ceremony at the Huntsman Center <laughs> behind enemy lines. <laughs> just kidding for folks out there. Uh, because Tim Shriver was giving the commencement address. Just happened, just happened this week. It, it, it was a marvelous speech. Talked about the importance of dignity. What they're doing on the dig, they have, they created something called the Dignity Index. And what they do is they take they, they take the, 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 the statements that are made by elected officials, folks running for office, and they, they rank them uh, on, on, on whether that expression uh, by the politician uh, recognizes the dignity of their opponent. And, and the idea is, at least as I understand it, the idea is this change in dialogue that, uh, that President Nelson is, is urging on us is not, it's not going to come from Washington. It, it, it's not going to come from us sitting back on the couch and, 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 and waiting for them to, to, to change. It, it, it's going to come when we demand it. When, 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 when we look at the Dignity Index and we say, you know, I like her as a candidate. I like her on positions A, B, and C, but I really dislike the way she speaks with contempt about others and her opponents. I dislike that. And, and, and then when that gets figured in and the American people start to demand that their elected officials treat with one another with respect, that, it's that sort of change. So uh, it's here in Utah. There she is over there. Uh, check it out. It's a great, it's a, it's a great project. But there, there are other things. There, there are other good things that are going on. What I'm about to say is not a partisan statement. I don't do partisan politics anymore. I have no party. I used to be, you know, I used to be a party guy. Uh, then I became a judge, and you just don't think about it partisan politics, and, I, and I, I don't anymore. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not partisan anymore. So this is not a partisan uh, comment, but it is significant to, to Utah. Um, Governor Cox is about to become the chairman of the National Governors Association for the next year. And, 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 and what happens when you become the chairman of the National Governors Association, you always have your pet project. You, know, you always have something you want to press that you think would be really good for the nation, and you've got 50 governors that you can share it with. His is this is pushing back against toxic political polarization. Um, uh, I think that's a great effort, Regar regardless of whether you vote for him or not, or you like his policies or not. Uh, this is something different than that. And it's, it's bipartisan. He's getting gov Democratic governors to buy in. And the whole idea is to try and uh, change, the, change the nature of the, uh, of, of the discourse. OK, so let me finish with this. What responsibility do we have as Latter-day Saints in this regard? Well, I quoted Richard Haas at the beginning from the Council on Foreign Relations. When he's talking about the need to overcome the toxic political polarization, he says a major responsibility for that lies with the religious communities, with the faith communities, and with religious leaders. So I want to finish with that that we as people of faith have a special obligation, a heightened duty to be the ones that work, that push against this toxic polarization. Okay, I'm a real low-tech guy, 
but I have a slide. Okay, we're ready for the slide. Okay, oh, here, it's right here. Okay, you can take, you can take the slide down now. Do, oh, can I do it? No, I don't want to touch it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, yeah. How are we using our faith? Are we using our faith to be healers, builders of bridges? Are we using it to divide? Uh, as a, let me make a side point right now. If we want to have religious liberty going forward in an increasingly secular age, we're not going to get it through the courts. There's a very favorable Supreme Court right now, but I'm telling you, that's not how it's going. The American people have to see that religious liberty does good, good things. And, and you know this from Sunday school, Sunday school classes. The Latin root of the word religion is, it's spelled, L, I don't read Latin, L-I-G-A-R-E. I think it's pronounced ligare. It's the same root as ligament. It means to bind together, to bind together. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, is my faith leading me to reconciliation, to binding people together, or am I using my faith to divide? And if, and if it's the latter, that's wrong, right? I mean, we, we know about atonement. We know, we know what it, God does atonement, the at one moment. That's what God does, and God's followers do at one moment, at one moment. Um, the best description of this I know from a Latter-day Saint source comes from a newly called general authority. Elder Rob Danes. He made these remarks when he was the president of the, the Menlo Park Stake just a couple years ago. God's work, he says, is a river of love headed your way. To serve God is to join a work party. People with picks, shovels, trying to help clear this channel for the river of God's love to reach his children at the end of the row. Single, married, gay, straight, black or white or brown or anything, educated or not, moneyed or not, employed or not, every race, every class, every person, every political party, mentally or physically ill, there is room for you in God's work. Grab a pick and shovel and join the team. It's that spirit that should animate not just our life in the church, but our life in, in, in our country. And so, and so let, let, me, let me finish with, with this. Uh, it, it, it'll sound familiar to you. Uh, it, it, it's going to be from President Nelson. Now, did you catch the news a couple of weeks ago about the honor President Nelson received? Morehouse College. What's, somebody tell me, what's the significance of Morehouse College? It's a, it's a historically black college. Who's its most illustrious graduate? Martin Luther King. Morehouse College is it's a great school, and it's highly symbolic. Morehouse College conferred on our President Nelson the first Gandhi Mandela King Peace Prize Award. And, and, and in that, in, in awarding him that, this is what they said. You have worked tirelessly to build bridges of understanding rather than create walls of segregation. You have inspired your church to radical inclusivity and solidarity by taking a stand for the rights of humankind everywhere, for your noble efforts to heal and reunite the broken body of Christ, and for your contributions to help make the scriptural proclamation that God so loved the world a tangible reality. Morehouse College salutes you. And then the next day, after giving him this award, the, the, the chapel of Morehouse College posted this on Facebook. I'm not on Facebook. One of my kids sent this to me. This, this is what the dean of the chapel at Morehouse said. From my careful observation, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is demonstrating faster movement into building bridges of understanding than any other institution in the country. People are noticing that about us. They're noticing what President Oaks has been saying. They're noticing what President Nelson has been saying. They're noticing the Utah Compromise. They're noticing the Respect for Marriage Act. And you may not 
like those, those were supported at the highest levels of the church. That's a church thing. We don't get into politics often. We did then from the highest level of the church. And it's been noticed. And people are remarking about we have a special role to play. Let me finish with the words of President Nelson. Let us, as a people, become a true light on the hill, a light that cannot be hid. Let us show that there is a peaceful, respectful way to resolve complex issues and an enlightened way to work out disagreements. The best is yet to come for those who spend their lives building up others. And I leave this with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, questions. Fire away. Oh, okay. okay. Sarah has trained me. This is, this is called a computer. And, uh, and, and, and it's got something on it called the Google. And it's, it's just, I understand it's really cool. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. And the reason we're doing this is because I, I don't want to take really tough questions, right? So, <laughs> so I look at that one and I say, oh, that's too tough. So um, here's one. Who is introducing Brother Griffith? Oh, that's from John. No, I see him. Um, uh, here's a question. Uh, what are some day? Uh, click on it. What are some day-to-day -day activities you you would suggest? What does it look like? Okay, I have I have an answer for for that. At least my answer. The first one is get get stop really stop cable. Stop it. Don't go to cable. Don't go to social media. Don't go to talk radio. It's bad stuff. It's really bad stuff. So I would say. I, I know I said earlier I wasn't going to tell you not to use it. I I was lying. Don't <laughs> don't use it. Don't use it. Uh, I, I heard uh, a, a prominent politician say recently, I used to watch cable all the time. I've been sober for the last eight years. So that's my, that's my first one. And what does it look like? It, no, it looks like signing up with folks like Braver Angels and others. There are, there are lots, of, lots of groups out there. It, 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 it looks different. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean we're sitting in our chair waiting for something to happen in Washington. If this is going to be solved, and I hope it is, I'm not confident it will be, but if it's going to be solved, it's going to be solved at the local level by you and me, obviously in our own lives, modeling this in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our wards, but, but no, to, to get involved with these groups out there doing it. Okay, hit the button back. Um, okay. What, what advice do you have for the youth that are trying to defend opinions Without, without a lot of information. Where do you find accurate information? Ah, this is really bad news. No, it really is. I, 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 have, I remember a sister in my ward not long ago said, I'm really busy, and she was. Um, I've got all sorts of commitments and activities. Is there some place I can go and, for 15 minutes a day and, and get the information? And I'm sorry, I've got really bad news. No, there's not. It takes time. It, it takes a lot of time, and it takes hard work and study. And, but you know, Sister Tanner Thomas, we can do hard things, OK? So uh, in my world, and I'm not saying it's the best world, but in my world, everybody, I mean, like everybody in my world reads three newspapers a day, not from beginning to end, but reads it. They read the New York Times. They read the Washington Post. They read the Wall Street Journal. Now, you may not like the editorial stances of those places, and they're not perfect, but they've got a tradition of, of reporting. And no, and I don't agree with everything in it, but, but that's, that's where people in, in my world, is my world the best world? Maybe not, but uh, that, so I think, I think it's that. So I go to those. I, I also read the National Review, and I read the New Republic to get on different sides. I was at a presentation recently with a guy named David French, and he said the same thing. He, 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 David French, before he writes, he's a conservative, writes for the New York Times, a column in the New York Times. He says that before he writes anything, he goes to what, who he thinks is the best person on the topic on either side of the issue. And he won't write anything till he's seen the arguments on, on both sides. Now, again, we're busy people. That takes time. But I don't, I don't have a great answer for you other than it takes time. I will put in a plug for the Deseret News, though. Look, I know, it's, you know, Deseret News does a pretty darn good job of, of, of this. They, they, you know, they, so I'm, I'm a fan. I, I also like the Trib, too, but, you know, but, but the Deseret News does, they, they, they work hard at this. I think they do a pretty good job. Um, 
Okay. Okay. Oh, Bruce, that's a tough question. Bruce Hagman wants to know, how common among judges is it to be truly nonpartisan? So, um, I will answer it this way. In my 15 years on the D.C. Circuit, I never once saw any of my colleagues make a decision that I thought was influenced in any way by their prior partisan affiliations. Not once, and I was looking for it. Now, now there's plenty of disagreement, but the disagreement is about law. It's not about policy. The disagreement is about what's the best way to read a statute? Now, now do you read a statute and, and you just look at the words and say, yeah, here's what the words mean. Or do you look at a statute and try and put it in context and say, well, Congress or the legislature was trying to address this issue and the purpose of this statute is this, so I'll interpret it that way. Plenty of disagreement about that, but that's not an agreement about whether you voted for Obama or Romney, right? That's not, um, and so I'm gonna defend the Supreme Court. I'm a big defender of the Supreme Court. Um, um, and, um, what I say, and I'll move on to this after this, what, what I say to folks is, I, I don't want to talk to anybody about Dobbs until you've read Dobbs. Okay? Now, again, that's bad news. <laughs> they don't write short opinions, right? But if you read the opinions of the Supreme Court, and, and let's say Dobbs, which, you know, said there's no right to abortion in the Constitution, or let's go o Obergefell, which found a, a right to same-sex marriage in the Constitution, so I'll do both of them. D I'm not going to talk with you about Orbergefell, which I disagree with, or Dobbs, which I agree with. I'm not going to talk to you about it unless we've, you've read the whole thing. And when you've read the whole thing, I, I, you're going to come away with, an, with the idea, and it's the idea that I have, that these, people, these are good people trying to figure out what the law is. They're not people trying to advance partisan interests. It, judges... I can only speak for D.C. Circuit judges and the ones I know on the screen. Don't think that way. They really don't. So, um, okay. How do I reach a family member who only watches one cable news channel, has drunk the Kool-Aid, and has gotten sucked into that deep fear of others? Well, you'd be nice, you know. <laughs> I, you know, I, I mean, I, no, you, you, you'd be nice, and, and I, I don't have a good answer to that. You, uh, I don't know. You show them by your example um, that there's 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 a there's a better way to do it. Um, that's not a very good answer. Um, as a 21 year old, looking at the political climate of America, it feels hopeless. It feels less and less like my voice has a vote. I feel like I fall in between this political spectrum and the one that really represents my interest. How do I get my voice out? How can I make a change? when you have to choose one side or the other to be able to get any sort of attention. Well, that's a, that's a tough one. We, we, we're, it's a party system. We have a party system, right? And, and uh, uh, you, you, you tend to be able to uh, advance your interests most if you're in one of the parties or the other. I mean, you can go third party route. You can say, I I'm an independent, but that, that's, that's, gonna be, that's gonna be tough sledding. So, so my, my, my suggestion is you, you choose the party that most aligns with your sensibilities and you, you get involved there, but you practice this, right? You practice this, whether it's the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. But no, uh, I, I have that feeling of hopelessness at, at, at times. Uh, these are not, these aren't, these aren't good times. This, this is tough times. Um, but I don't know any other solution to the problem that we're in right now except to, to get involved and but to get involved in the way that President Oaks is required of us. So, so I'm, you know, we're not supposed to talk politics in church, we're not to, but no, you get, join a party and be a voice of reason in, in that party. So I, there, I'm looking for one question that I always get asked, but there are just too many questions here. Um, but here's the one I want to be asked. So I gave this presentation a couple weeks ago at a, a gathering of Latter-day Saint MBA students, um, uh, and, uh, um, the first question I got was something like this. Yeah, that sounds nice, you know, kumbaya, let's hold hands. What about Captain Moroni? Huh? What about Captain Moroni? 
He wasn't doing that, was he? Was he? He thought he had me, and I, I thought he did too. And, 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 and I'm actually not very good uh, on my feet. I'm really not. I, 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 I got a lot of confidence if I can puzzle things through, but on my feet, I was, but I thought I, I'll tell you my answer, and you took, I thought I nailed the answer on this one. Maybe I didn't. I, I was really pleased with myself. I said, you're right, you're right. This isn't Captain Moroni. But I don't ever remember sustaining Captain Moroni as the president of the church. But I do remember sustaining Russell M. Nelson as president of the church. And you know what he's telling me? He's telling us this. And then I quoted from the Palm Sunday Address. Is that? <laughs> Christian Dees likes it, but he, he's easy. I don't know. That, I, don't, I don't see the question here, so I, I had to ask it myself. Uh, um, Okay, how do we as church members use our personal religious beliefs to guide our personal political ideology without entangling them with Christian nationalistic views? Okay, there's a lot in there. There's, there's a lot in there. Um, um, and again, I don't have the answer to everything, and I'm, I'm not the best example of everything. But I, I would tell you, so I've been a political junkie like all my life. I grew up in Washington, D.C. I, I, I'm from the swamp. No, I am. I am. Uh, I went to, I went to uh, public schools in suburban Washington, D.C. with the sons and daughters of the deep state. The finest group of people I know. Patriots love their country, okay? So, that, so there's my biases. You see my biases right now. But, but I, 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 you know, since I was a kid, you know, I, you know, I was a kid. I would read, you know, political magazines and stuff. And I, I was, I was, I can remember the day. I'm getting a little far afield here, but I'm coming. I'll come back to that. I, I actually can remember the day in second grade when Mrs. Marshall in Franklin Sherman Elementary School called me out because I was doing something disruptive. She said, "Tommy, stop doing that, or I'll take you to the principal's office." And here's the thought that went through my. This shows you how bad I am. The thought that went through my mind was, "Ooh." When I run for the Senate, that's going to come out against me. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, I, I, so that, that is the point. So, so I, 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 part of my identity is political junkie. Okay, now having said that, I have never thought, I've never thought that my political views were the Lord's views. No. No, they're my views. I, so, so I don't believe that my, I, I don't look to scripture, well, I, actually, I take that back. I do, I, do, I do think there is a common, I think there is something in scripture, something in Revelation that, that ought to inform all of our political judgments, okay? And here it is. It was best stated by Mitch Daniels, who was the governor of Indiana and the chancellor of Purdue University and was the Director of Office of Management Budget in the Bush administration, and a devout Christian. R Mitch Daniels says this, and I think this, I think this ought to be the common ground for all political involvement in America. He said, our first thought in all things is always, you get that emphasis? Our first thought in all things is always those who, have, who are on the first rung of life's ladder and how we might help them climb. That's our first thought, always. So that, so that belief, which is scriptural, right? It's Matthew 25. Uh, that has informed my political thought. Now, we can have lots of disagreements about how you do that, right? As a political conservative, I disagree with, with uh, progressives about the best way to provide opportunity for those on the first rung of life's ladder. But I do believe that what Daniel says is right. Our first thought always needs to be for those on the first rung of life's ladder and how, how to help them climb. But other than that, no. My, my religious views don't affect my view on marginal tax rates. It just doesn't. My, my religious views don't affect my views on free trade or not. It's just not. I've just, I, I've never thought, I've never thought that the Lord really has a view on those matters. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but um, okay, let's keep going here. Um, do you believe trust is being drained out of the Supreme Court? Uh, yeah, 
yeah, it's not a good time uh, for the Supreme Court. Um, you know, public opinion polling shows that its its favorability ratings are uh, lower than 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 they've ever than they've ever been. Um, and uh, I think there are a lot of reasons uh, for that. I think um, uh, I think one of the reasons is that uh, in our system of government, um, uh, we the people are to make the laws, to decide the rules by which society governs. And, and, and we don't have, it's, it's not unelected judges in robes who decide what's fair and just and equitable. It's, it's we the people through our elected representatives. Uh, and when the Supreme Court gets outside of its lane and starts acting like a legislature, then they're going to be open to criticism uh, as legislature. So I think there's some, some element of, of, of that going, going on. But I think the biggest problem uh, it, 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 in my mind, is that uh, politicians are using ju the judicial nomination process to, to, score, to score political points. And when they do that, um, they, they, they hurt the judiciary. Um, uh, one of the greatest honors of my life came a little over a year ago when um, Justice uh, Ketanji Brown Jackson asked me to introduce her to the, the United States Senate in her confirmation hearings. People thought that was novel and odd because I was appointed by President George W. Bush. I'm a, I'm a political conservative. I'm a, I call myself a post-partisan political conservative, but I'm, but I'm a conservative. And here's a, uh, someone who had been a political progressive being nominated by uh, a Democratic president, and, and she asked me to introduce her, and I, I was happy to do so. L let me tell you, oh, this is being taped. Okay. I can do it. Um, so, uh, so I was, I was honored. So, uh, Katanji calls me. I, I knew her. We were on the the, the same court in, in, in Washington D.C. in the same building. I, I knew her pretty well and thought thought highly of her. Um, and, and so she called and asked me. And I said I'd be happy to do this. Uh, I called the White House Counsel at the time and said, Hey, would you, would you come up with a draft? You know, just get me started on this. You know, I don't want to mess up. Send a draft over. So a day later, they. They send a draft over, and it was awful. It was just terrible. <laughs> it was just like, just like reading her resume, and I thought, ah, man, this isn't going to be any good. So I said, I can revise this. They said, oh, yeah, feel free to revise it. And so I can't remember the exact words I used, and they weren't as blunt as what I'm about to say now, but this was the, this was the gist of the message. That it went something like this. People think it's noteworthy that I, as a conservative appointed by a Republican president, would support the confirmation of somebody appointed by a Democratic president. Well, you know, there was nothing unusual about that not that long ago. It happened all the time. Then I pointed out Justice Anthony Scalia was confirmed by a vote of 98 to nothing. His protege and acolyte, Amy Coney Barrett, didn't get a single vote from the other side of the aisle. And, and you can switch, you can flip it around. It's a pox on both houses. And so, so I addressed that. And, and, and I didn't say a pox on both houses, but I, did, I, <laughs> but I didn't use those words, but that's what I said. I said, I'd like to go back to regular order where presidents get their Supreme Court nominees because they win elections and you get them. And, and, and in my view, the best of all possible worlds is you get an Antonin Scalia and you get a Katanji Brown Jackson. The country is better for, the, for that sort of thing. So I, that, was, that was the... The, the pitch I made, and I sent it back to the White House thinking, oh, they're not going to go for this because it's criticizing both sides. They loved it. They loved it. I got to do it, and it was, it, it was, uh, it was a wonderful experience for me. Um, but I feel that way. Now, uh, it, it, Justice Jackson, if you're listening to this, I, I know you won't be offended by what I'm about to say, but if I were President of the United States, I would actually never put you on the Supreme Court, okay? But I'm not President of the United States. Joe Biden is, and he gets to pick his folks. If I were President of the United States, we would have nine people named Amy Coney Barrett, right? That, 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 that's, my, that's, that's my model. That's my, but I'm not President. I didn't win the election. President Biden did. So um, anyway, so why, where was I headed with that? Oh, yeah, here I was headed with that. So um, 
I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a supporter of, of the court as an institution. Uh, um, uh, what, what I suggest to folks is uh, don't rely on, once again, don't rely on media accounts. Uh, do the hard work yourself. The media far too often, they're working on, most of them are working on deadlines. Um, and they, they fall into this habit, which just drove me crazy when I was on the DC circuit, of identifying a judge by the president who appointed her, you know, as if that was an explanation for everything. Let me tell you a personal example of that. I was on the case uh, that was argued in front of the DC circuit and then went to the Supreme Court uh, that, that is known as Heller. It was the case that for the first time recognized uh, took the view that the Second Amendment protects the right of an individual to own a firearm to defend yourself. I, I, was, I was on the court, the DC Circuit, that, that held that, and then we were affirmed by the Supreme Court. So in all the media accounts, and I was pretty, I was pretty new to the court at the time, in all the media accounts, they identified Griffith, a Bush appointee, as if to say, you know, wink, wink, nod, nod, he's a big gun guy, right? Well, let me tell you something about myself. I am not a gun guy. At all, they scare me to death. Okay, if it were up to me, I'm going to lose many of you right now. I would repeal the Second Amendment. <laughs> I don't like it, but it's there. It's the law. It, it, it's part of the Constitution. Whether I agree with it or not, my duty as a judge is to enforce the law, to apply uh, the law. And so, um, but anyway, the media, so I hate it when they do that. They just make all sorts of assumptions about a judge be because of that. Okay. There are a lot of questions here. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, how do we balance uh, building bridges with defending truth? So, it's hard work, right? We can do hard things. Um, it, it raises a good point. Um, we're not, we don't compromise at all cost, right? <laughs> no, it, the, the point of this isn't just to get everyone to agree, whatever it is, right? No, there's some principles that we stand for. There's some, there's some non-negotiables, right? And in America, there, for all of us, there, there have to be at least two non-negotiables. You have to be dedicated to liberty and equality. If, if, if you're dedicated to those, you can come in for Thanksgiving dinner, right? And you can be with the grown-ups at Thanksgiving dinner. If you have not demonstrated a wholehearted commitment to liberty and equality, I'm sorry, you're probably not going to get an invitation to Thanksgiving dinner or you're gonna to have to sit at the kids' table, right? The coin of the realm is liberty and equality. Now, we can have lots of disagreements about what those mean. It's not obvious what they mean, but there's gotta be a commitment to, to, to those. So that's, that's one, non-negotiable. I'm sorry, I don't negotiate with a white supremacist, nor do I negotiate with a black supremacist, right? Because they're not into equality. Okay, so that's so. So I think there are some there's some there's some non-negotiables. Now, um, I, I was I was present um, when President Oaks gave his talk at the University of Virginia a couple of years ago. Uh, I was honored to be able to accompany him on that. Uh, we had a wonderful lunch with the president of the University of Virginia, um, where President Oaks described his talk, what he was gonna what he was gonna say, and then that he gave the talk. It's, 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 at the, it's at the LDS newsroom, you can find it. Uh, it's a great talk. He, he has said that he, that he maybe gave more thought to this talk on this topic than, than, he, than he ever had before. When he got up to speak, it was either there or in the lunch, he said that he was speaking uh, to his people on behalf of the United Voice of the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. That's, you know, that's, that's the big guns, right? I mean, that's, that's serious. And, and I'll summarize what President Oak said. And you go read it yourself and see if I'm doing justice to it. I think, I think I'm getting it right. He said, my people need to be willing to give up some of their religious liberty so that people in the LGBT community can have more of theirs. 
Now you go read it and see if that, uh, that's what he said. That's what he said. Now what's he telling us there? I think what he's telling us there is we need to be really thoughtful and careful about what is core. And that's hard thinking. What is core? What are the issues on which we, we do not compromise? And I get the sense that they are a lot, it's a lot smaller footprint for that than maybe, than maybe we think. And, and I think to be, to play the role in society that I think President Nelson is calling us to play, that I think the Constitution calls us to play, it, it requires some real reflection about what, what is core, and maybe, maybe it's a lot smaller. But when you get to that core, no, 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 you, no, you defend it. But once again, how do you defend it? How, how do you defend it? Do you defend it in a way that recognizes the dignity of the person you're disagreeing with? And, and, and so here's the gamble we're making on, uh, on, on President Oaks and the, the church's initiative on the Utah Compromise and now the Respect for, for Marriage Act. It's been, been widely criticized by our former, uh, f former, former friends uh, on, in, in the religious liberty uh, world, widely criticized uh, that, that the church has made a mistake going down this, this path. Here, here's, as I see it, here's the gamble we're making. And I think it is a gamble. There's no question it's a gamble. We're gambling that if we can show to others that we genuinely care about them, that we really do care about how they're treated by others. Um, and, 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 and if we're willing to give up some of the things that we've thought we needed so that they can be cared for, Here's the gamble. The gamble is that will be reciprocated. That will be reciprocated. That's a big gamble. <laughs> but that's where we are right now. That's the gamble that's being made. I'd rather be on that side of it than on the culture warrior side of it. Yeah. Personal story. I used to be a culture warrior. That's how I thought of myself. I thought, you know, you know go to the lines and fight, fight, fight for all these issues that I thought were so important. And then I heard President Oaks, 2014, 2015, he gives this talk in California where he says, we are not culture warriors. We are not at war with our fellow citizens. And when he said that, it really hit me. I thought, well, actually, I am a culture warrior. <laughs> but, but maybe I shouldn't be. Maybe I ought to stop viewing my fellow citizens with whom I disagree on some fundamental matters. That, that, that they're not, again, back to Lincoln, they're not enemies, that they're friends. And, and, and maybe if, if I try and get into their world and understand it better than I have now, uh, maybe I, I'll, I'll see things a little bit differently. And I, and I tell you, and I have. Uh, my views on a number of issues have, have softened and, 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 and changed because of that. I'm not saying yours will, but, 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 but mine have. Um, so that today, Today, I have my pet list of issues. We, we don't talk politics in church, so maybe we've got in the parking lot. I can tell you what my pet list of, uh, of issues is. But today, my number one issue is this. I, 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 I believe, one man who knows, I believe we're facing an existential crisis in the country. I really do. We, the, the course that we are on right now is not sustainable. It, 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 it is not, I used to tell my law clerks, you know, every year I get these four bright young law school graduates who help me in my work. And you get to know them really well and you have all sorts of discussions. And, you know, and I had them, I was a judge long enough that we went through several election cycles and I, I hired my clerks without regard to their ideology. So I'd get, I'd get liberals, I'd get conservatives, I'd get all over the place and we'd have these fun discussions at, at lunch about politics. And, and we'd go through these election cycles and. Uh, and, you know, the liberals would have lost and they'd be all discouraged about, oh, the country's coming down. And then, you know, the conservatives lost and they'd be all discouraged in the next cycle. And I would always tell them, my standard line would always tell them, hey, these things happen, they come and go, the republic is going to survive. The republic is going to survive. Last couple of years, I have not said that. I am I just becoming a grumpy old man? May I might be. I might, I might be. But I... President Oak says be optimistic. I'm going to be optimistic. But I think we're in a serious problem. I think it's an existential crisis. I think these statistics that we're talking about, the division that we see 
is an existential crisis. Uh, it, it's my hope and prayer that we can be the way out. I know I'm out of time, but I, got, I forgot one thing that I got to tell you. In the last four or five months, I've had a number of conversations with some, I won't name them because they were private conversations, with some very influential thought leaders on the left and on the right. And what they have told me was astounding to me. They're watching us carefully. They're watching particularly what happened with the Utah Compromise, particularly what happened with the Respect for Marriage Act. They're listening to what President Oaks is saying. They all know the line. They all know the line on contested issues we should seek to moderate and to unify. They, they, they know what a ward is. And they know that in a ward, we learn how to get along with people. You know, we, none of us got to, you, you don't choose where you go to church. You live here, you go there. So that means you're going to be going to church with somebody you might not really like, right? And you learn to love them. They know about that. This is, the, 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 the ward is a unique laboratory for Christian living. And you all got excited when we went to two hours. <laughs> I'm a four-hour guy. But anyway, that's, that's another issue. No, but they, they know this about, they know about missions. They know, they, they know our culture well. And there's what they're saying. I've had four or five discussions like this. They're saying, you guys are the way out. If we're going to make it, it's going to be the Latter-day Saints. Now, those conversations have blown my mind. But I've had them, and I've had them with names of people you would recognize. But they were private conversations, so I'm not going to reveal them now. They see something in us that maybe we don't see. But it looks like President Nelson sees it. And it looks like President Oak sees it. Now, this is different. This is different than what we've ever been before. But what, what's that line from The Chosen when the disciples say to Jesus, wow, this is different. You remember his response? Get used to different. I think, I think we're at a place where we need to get used to different. And we need to see ourselves in a different role than maybe we've ever seen before. And my personal opinion is we saw that on Palm Sunday when we saw a prophet of God tell us, Here's your role, peacemaker. Peacemaker. That's what it is. Well, you've been patient. You've been kind. There are lots of questions I, I, I didn't get to. Um, um, but uh, I appreciate that, that, that you coming out. Um, um, uh, I, 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 I'm trying to be optimistic. Um, I'm actually very nervous. Um, but I do have faith that, uh, that we're being pointed uh, in a direction that will be a, can be a pretty exciting one if we're willing to change and if we're willing to become peacemakers. And I leave this with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Griffith. This has been wonderfully informative and wonderfully inspiring. In our stake, we have a, a stake theme. And I have a, a name or a wristband here, and it says, I'm trying to be like Jesus. And I wonder if you'd come up one more time and just answer that question. What would Jesus do? Or how can we be more like him, maybe using some of his suggestions and direction? And then after you're done, um, Bishop Adam Lowe will give the benediction. To the extent that I understand uh, Jesus, um, uh, in my frail efforts to follow him and imitate him, um, I think he's best understood by the word at one moment, by the word atonement. That's what he does. We, we know from the Garden of Eden story, and this is a Hugh Nibley idea, we know from the Garden of Eden story that Satan seeks to divide, right? In the Garden of Eden story, he sought to divide men from women. And Nibley would say, that's his calling card. When you see division in the world, most often, Satan's going to be behind it. The flip side of that is, when you see at one moment, when you see reconciliation, when you see efforts to build bridges of understanding, most likely, 
what you're seeing is the work of Christ. The greatest challenge, the first century church, the greatest challenge they had was creating unity in the church between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. That was the greatest challenge. Uh, they succeeded a little bit, didn't succeed other places. Remember from your missions, John 17. What did we always use John 17 for, where Christ is praying to his Father? We always use that to point out our understanding of the nature of the Godhead. Look, Jesus and the Father. But in that, in, in that passage that we use as a missionary to make the point about the nature of the Godhead, I always overlooked something that somebody pointed out to me recently. The Savior is praying to the Father that his disciples would be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. Well, I stopped there. I stopped there. But keep reading. And you keep reading. Why? Why? was he praying that the church would be unified so that the world might believe that thou hast sent me. The primary witness we can offer the world of the divinity of Christ, the primary witness, is that we become peacemakers. We become builders of bridges of unity. My fanciful hope, and I, I don't, it's not fanciful, my hope is that five, ten years from now, people will say, oh, you're a Latter-day Saint. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, poly yeah, polygamy, polygamy, yeah. And, oh, you're the ones that work at reconciling people, right? You're the ones that work at building bridges of understanding. I, I, I think we have a president of the church who's pointing us in that direction. So, that's a long answer. How do you be like Jesus? I think you'd be like Jesus in our own personal relationships and in everywhere we go, that we're the one in the room that's trying to understand others and, 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 bring, them, and bring them together. So. Our dear Father in heaven, we're grateful for this evening which we've had to gather as saints and to listen and to learn. We are grateful for the blessing of agency and the right to choose that we've been granted in our lives and help us that we might be able to use that agency to demonstrate unity and an understanding and love to those around us. We are grateful for a living prophet here upon the earth and for his example and his teachings and help us that we may be able to follow his example to build bridges of understanding and to become peacemakers that we might be able to exercise the gospel in our lives to follow the example of our Savior. Let our light so shine that we might be able to show the way to those, those around us what a true disciple should, should look like. We love thee, Father. We're grateful for that gospel in our lives and help us that we may be able to share that with others and to especially our, our, our children, our families, our loved ones, and be able to share that light with others. And we ask and pray for these things in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.